Good evening, everyone. I'm Tran Bowie. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. So while we are being told to stay home, there are reporters and videographers still out in the field. And that includes my friend and colleague, Arshit Chishadri, who is with me right now. And we coordinated in blue. Hi. We did it. Coincidentally, right? Pure coordination in blue. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. And hopefully we can we can have a fun conversation, talk about this unfortunate situation with the first coronavirus pandemic. But I also really want to plug in a couple of uh, you know nuggets, good things that are coming out of this. Uh, it's like I, I like to call it the major reset button that Mother Nature has given all of us. Yes, well, I have a lot of questions. But you're the host. I'm gonna let you. Uh, no, no, I have, I have a lot of questions. Um, you know, and so interesting. This is what live TV news is. Moments before we went on the air, um, you told me that there is breaking news in the weather. So I had to quickly look on, and I'm seeing that there's like we could possibly have a level four out of five yeah. um, severe weather. So do you have the latest for us? I do actually, it's insane. It's, I mean, you know, if, if you thought the coronavirus pandemic for those of you in Georgia is not enough, and this on Easter Sunday, when a lot of you may be at church or with family, and hopefully most of you are not doing that, we have severe weather rolling in through parts of Northern Georgia overnight, so between midnight and about 4 a.m. So for those of you who are listening, once you're done with this, please, please charge your phones, charge your iPads, download weather apps, your local news networks, whichever ones you choose to download, whether it's Fox 5, ABC, WSB, CBS 46, Love and Alive, whichever one that is, download those apps so you have the information and keep your phone charged. Uh, they're supposed to be moving it through 1 to 3 a.m., I believe. There's uh, heavy winds, tornadoes. So it's like we're already dealing with this pandemic, and now here's another force of Mother Nature. And the worst part is it's happening in the middle of the night when many of us are sleeping and probably not going to be paying attention. So really be careful. If you have a basement or place without windows, definitely keep those areas flashlights, chargers, phones, water, all of that stuff. Hopefully you won't need it, but as, as we know in the TV business, as Tran can uh, attest to it, always better to be extra prepared and uh, ready. So yeah. we are over-prepared and, you know, uh, instead of being underprepared. So hopefully yeah. that's going to be a, it's crazy to think that how much more can we handle, right? I mean, we already have this and now we got to be a weather too and tornadoes. Oh my God. I know. So let's go with the, the latest developments on COVID-19. Yeah. So um, you have been covering just about everything. I see you with the latest numbers. I see you covering the governor's uh, news conferences. Um, let's break it down. What are the latest developments? And let's start with the latest numbers. Absolutely. And this is unfortunate, one of those uh, you know statistics. We see these numbers over and over again. In fact, tomorrow, Monday, April the 13th, will be six weeks since Georgia had its first two cases of the coronavirus. So I remember that Monday because my mom and I were watching this movie. We had gone out and we went to watch this Indian movie, this Bollywood film. And I'm getting all these text updates. And I'm like, oh my God, what's going on at nine o'clock at night? And there was a press conference happening that night, Monday, March the 2nd. And this was at 10 o'clock at night, which which almost got my you know journalistic brain. It's like, well, why would they do that so late at night unless there was something breaking? Yeah. Anyway, long story short, uh, First two cases, Monday, March the 2nd. And these numbers just came out. So now I'm going to read those out to you uh, oh, right cool. now. It's 12,545 people. 12,545 people in the state of Georgia now testing positive. Uh, there are more than 2,500 people in the hospital still, and the death toll, 442. Think about that in perspective. In, in six weeks, we have more than 12,000 people who have tested positive. 442 deaths yeah. in six weeks. I mean... It's unfortunate. And one of the hardest hit areas in Georgia is actually Doherty County. That's southwest Georgia and Albany. And uh, there was a funeral there, a couple of funerals in February. A lot of people mixing, mingling, wiping noses, wiping eyes, hugging, kissing, touching. And it's like the recipe for disaster. And we don't know who had it. We don't know who brought it. And unfortunately, they have 1,173 cases and uh, 72 deaths. Just about one area, Albany, Georgia. So anyway, that's the lo latest local numbers. Um, of course, if you've been following... Um, the Johns Creek, uh, uh, Johns Hopkins, Johns Creek, Johns Creek is in Atlanta. Johns Hopkins uh, University has you know, collaborated with a lot of different resources and put together numbers. So you can you can look up all these numbers at home. I would say look at the Georgia Department of Health for state numbers. They've added a couple of maps. If you want you know national numbers, other states, other countries, you can look at the Johns Hopkins. So 1.8 million people. Wow. 1.8 million around the world. 113,914. 48 people have died. And that's insane. Those stats in the U.S., unfortunately, is now the epicenter 
554,000 people, more than that, in fact, these numbers keep adding up, and 20, nearly 22,000 deaths. So the U.S., most number of cases, and most number of deaths. And, you know, I know a lot of times, uh, Tran, you know, when we talk about numbers, it's it's hard because it's just another number. Yeah, but right. when you can put a face or a person or someone that we all, unfortunately, or don't want to know, it just becomes so real. So. Yeah. And so, and speaking of that, um, this is airing in Roswell, Fulton County. So can you look at the numbers for yeah. us? Okay. Absolutely. So let's go through Fulton County. So they don't break it into North and South Fulton, but Fulton is, is a huge county. For those of you who live in Atlanta, of course, know uh, 1,490 cases in Fulton County. So that includes, of course, Roswell, Alpharetta, city of Atlanta bucket all the way. So they don't break it up into North and South, but uh, almost 1,500 people in Fulton County affected and 50 people have died. So after Albany, Georgia, Doherty County, Fulton is number two. Oh, wow. Um, but, but you also have to put that in perspective that it's the biggest, it's you know, it's so big, it's so huge, covering North Atlanta and South Atlanta. And if you go to the Department of Health website, uh, that's at dph.georgia.gov, there's a lot of reports. Even GEMA is putting out daily reports. Um, it, you know, it's interesting because they're breaking it down by race now. There's also... Uh, whatever they're able to report that so we've been asking these questions uh, in a very nice way but that's our job as journalists and reporters to find out that information and they've now added race you know the people who are um who are reporting so whoever is able to you know once they get those certificates the death certificates or the patient information they're not putting listing race they're putting in age people with underlying conditions broken down by county uh, in fact i believe yesterday it was the youngest death in georgia a 22 year old girl from Columbus, Georgia, but she had existing conditions. But regardless, it still doesn't take it away from that loss, right? So it's still yes. And I saw um, I saw a report that you did that you actually tracked um, tracked it for us, and um, and like you were saying, based on race and, and age and gender. So um, it said that more men was that right? More men. There, yes, usually more men and those with underlying conditions. And now there's a new report saying it's typically African Americans are seeing they're seeing a lot more cases of African-Americans being uh, affected with, with the coronavirus or getting complications. So again, it's one of those things, it's so early to, to tell because this is sort of a, it keeps changing. They themselves, you know, the official, state official themselves don't know. And we even asked them, they said, you know, sometimes the local hospitals are reporting numbers. Uh, sometimes we see numbers from uh, the Department of Health and, and numbers are not always the same, right? So we're, and, and I, the Department of Health said they have, they're not real time because they have to wait Till they get that death right, certificate. Right, right. It's not like, oh, you know, someone in North Fulton at the hospital or Northside or St. Joseph passed away and then it's immediately sent to the Department of Health. There's a process, they gotta let you know next family and can know, then get a certificate and then get that in. And even with that, it's like you have to, you know, maybe they don't want to reveal certain details like on you know, age and race and all those things. So a lot of that is HIPAA and it's privacy. So you, they're not always readily available, but whenever they are, they do update those. So that's sort of that disparity, the difference between. Um, and, and you also had said, okay, so the median age was 74. You said the youngest was 29. Um, we we're looking at some other conditions, diabetes, obesity, if you have compromised immune system, um, other things, something else I didn't um, mention. I think a lot of those uh, are right. You know, if you already, if you are already, if you already have a lot of existing conditions, right? If you're someone perhaps who has had a bout with cancer or dealt with cancer and you're going through, uh, chemotherapy already dealing with a lot, but those are people typically who have weaker immune systems. And those people, especially, um, for example, my mom is a cancer survivor. Thank God she's okay. She's a three-time survivor. They don't go outside the house. My parents do not leave the house. Absolutely. Like, even for a walk, which is which is fine. They they are a little careful, a little cautious. Right. They were in India actually for a few um, a few weeks. And anyway, if you have a weaker Im immune system, it is up to you to sort of build up that immunity. And I know that's hard to do, but there's a lot of things that you can do at home. Lots of water, lots of lemon, lots of ginger, lots of greens, lots of vegetables. But the people who have lung disease or heart disease, uh, kidney issues, uh, diabetes, existing health conditions are definitely more at risk. But I think as the data and more and more people have tested, they're seeing that this is not necessarily someone, you know, people who are older. Sure, if you have underlying conditions, yes, you're at more risk. But that doesn't mean that if you're 20 or you're 30, you're completely fine. I mean, we saw the cases in the, the spring breakers in Florida. A lot of them did test positive. Right. So I think th this is so early to tell who is going to be develop complications and who, who's a okay. every we're, we're all sort of in this giant pool together. But of the cases they've seen, a lot of people in nursing homes, retirement homes, long-term care facilities, because it's quicker and easier to spread. And if you're in that 
location where there's a lot of people with a lot of health condition and complication, and that's the same air you're breathing. It just takes one person to spread that virus. So that's why it's so important to stay home and flatten that curve. They keep talking about that, but it, it is something that all of us, you know, we all see superheroes, right? You, you think about your favorite superhero, whoever that is. You have a chance to be a superhero right now. And all you have to do is stay home. Not that hard. You don't have to fly. No Batmobile. No Spider-Man. Climbing buildings. Just stay at home and do your part for the rest of the world. Because even if you're fine, you may have those asymptomatic symptoms and could spread it to somebody else. And that's, yeah. that's sort of the, the, the key here. So I want to say um, welcome to all the people who are joining us now. Thank you. I know it's Easter evening, but this is when Arsha um, actually had the night off to, to join us. So thank you. I want to say um, Allie Jones is saying great advice on building your immune system. So um, we appreciate that. So let's take a look at the testing. I, you had reported this week also that there were new um, testing you know, facilities uh, that were available. So how readily available and who can get tested at this point? And that's a great question. I think that's what everybody really wants to know. My mom was like, should I get tested? I have a you know, sore throat. I think the people who need to get tested, you should have some of those conditions. Would the CDC and the health experts keep sort of changing those definitions and those guidelines? Those are shortness of breath, fever, uh, you know, a dry cough. And now they're saying it's even, you're even able to contract coronavirus or COVID-19 through, through uh, it's, it's a respiratory illness, right? That's why they're telling people wear masks everywhere. So going back to your question about testing, this week, CVS has rolled out a testing facility at Georgia Tech, and you have to go onto the website to, uh, to, to request and put your name on that list. They can test up to 1,000 people a day. Then there are private labs and companies. There is a company called Ipsum, I-P-S-U-M, Ipsum Diagnostics. They are able to roll out 2,000 tests a day. And there's, of course, your Quest, your Quest Diagnostics, your LabCorp. All of these other private labs are also able to test. So there is a lot of testing now, but believe it or not, we, we sort of crunched the numbers. Georgia's population is what, 10.5 million? Half of them are in Atlanta, so 50% are right here. So less than a percent, in fact, 0.5% of the state's population has been tested so far. Wow. So that's the numbers that we're reflecting. So of course, the more you test, you're going to see more cases. That doesn't mean that everybody needs to be tested. And the problem is they don't have enough kits. We don't know who to blame. I mean, you know, it's easy to point the finger and blame. But I think if you get those conditions, you feel like you have those aches and chills and those symptoms, you need to contact the COVID hotline. Uh, there is the very easy to find look at the Georgia COVID hotline or contact your healthcare professional from your house. And they will tell you, okay, I think this is what you have. There's also Emory. Emory has a, a new app uh, and a website, c19check.com. I'm going to double check that. I've done a couple of stories, but C19check.com. That is right. So C for COVID 19 check.com, an absolutely free website. Uh, you go through it. I did it myself. It asks you for a couple of different questions like age, symptoms, risk factors, and things like that. So that's a great way to get tested, sort of, you know, the, the, the pre to the test before you actually get tested. Here's the thing you don't want to waste a test if you really aren't sick. Suppose there's only a thousand available or, you know, 3,000 or whatever the number is. If you're Perfectly fine. Let's not waste a test. How oh, they talk about the uh, PPE. Let's not waste those masks and gloves for the people who really need it. So if you're kind of like, I'm, you know, a little tired and sleep well, well, stay home. Drink a lot of water and honey and, you know, don't worry about getting tested. If you do, of course, feel like you have maybe coronavirus or those symptoms, then, of course, you do want to get, get it tested because you're doing yourself a favor and the people who live with you. So how long, so you've had those conditions, you know, those symptoms, how long, how many days before you think it's serious enough to get tested. And the other thing is, um, what does the testing entail? Like the actual test kits? Absolutely. So I have not had the test, so I'm not 100% sure on how it differs between the state lab and the CDC. But from what we've learned is the testing is a nose swab. Okay. So, you know, when you get the flu, it's they, 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 they stick something up your nostrils. And apparently with this, they, they go really further up. So it's a little uncomfortable that they, they want to do that swab. There's a lot of tests now that are available uh, the Emory one, for example, right? Uh, we talked to a doctor at Emory, and they said it's available within 24 hours to get to them. So uh oh, I think I just lost him because of the severe weather. Um, so I'm going to wait for him to log back on. 
Um, as I said, this is um, Arshit Shashadri. He is a global journalist. He's actually worked all over the world. His last major um, anchoring job was in India, but he's worked here at CNN and several of the networks. He's now working at Nexstar. And what he does for Nexstar is he goes out and does stories, and those stories will air on various networks um, in Georgia, as well as the Carolinas. Um, and right before we went on the air, I did want to say that there are reports that we are going to have some severe weather overnight. It looks like it may start about 11 o'clock tonight in West Georgia and then move into Metro Atlanta by early morning. Um, so with that said, they were saying that we could reach a level four out of five. Um, and here he is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Live TV, guys. I don't know what happened. But oh, now I, I can't is, hear is you. Is the weather, is the internet gone? What's going on here? So sorry to me interrupt you, but I am back. Oh, you're good. You're good. Um, okay, so I was I was giving everyone an update about the the severe weather. Um, so for those of you who are watching, if you have questions, this man is full of information. He's been covering COVID nineteen since the very beginning. He's been at um, the governor's uh, media briefings and press conferences. Um, so let's just back up a little bit. Uh, I was just sharing with our viewers more about you and um, and just how long you've been in the business and what you've been doing. So I consider you a global reporter because you have um, traveled all over the world and your latest um, huge anchor job was in India, but you, you know, you call Atlanta home. So tell us how long you've been in the business. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's so you you realize how old you are once you say it out loud. But I've been in the business now for 12 years, 10 full time. So a decade. And oh, it's crazy. And it's been a, it's been a blast. It's been a ride. It's been fun. Uh, I started in Macon, Georgia, at a small market, 13 WMAZ. Then I was in Augusta, Charlotte, at CNN in Atlanta, at CNN International. Then I went to India for two years to anchor, came back here freelance. And then I'm back here on the air here in Atlanta as the Atlanta Bureau correspondent covering the southeast. So my, my job here was really to cover the capital, the, the capital reporter and statewide issues. And then, of course, we were doing a couple of stories with the CDC, like the flu and vaping and all that. And then coronavirus hit. And it's like everyone, literally, that's the only story that everyone is covering and doing because that's all that, that, that we can do because what everybody cares about. Unless, of course, there's severe weather like tonight. Well, tonight. But, um, no, I, I think in, in, in the decade or in my lifetime, I would say this is hands down the biggest story that journalists have ever had to cover. And the world... You know, we, we, we've gone through a 9-11 and that was unfortunate, but I mean, this is like the entire world is sort of coming together and dealing with this mm -hmm. and learning and relying on each other. And somebody talked about the Spanish flu and, you know, the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic. They didn't have Internet and technology and, the, you know, television as, as widely and as rampant as we have. We have Instagram Live and a laptop and Internet and Facebook and a multitude of media and people like Tran who are able to talk and interview and we are able to get the information out quicker. So hopefully we've learned and progressed, but you know, it's weirdly funny how history repeats itself. You know, right. the roaring twenties, certainly, you know, they, we know the 1920s and look what we are in 2020. I know. I mean, hell, all that stuff completely so, changed with one virus. Well, you know, and I was trying to think back. Um, so I, I, I was in TV news for 15 years. Uh, started it was in Memphis, right? You know, my friend yeah. D, that's how we, we kind of connected. Have, yeah. With D Griffin. Yes, that's, we have that kind we have that connection. So that was my last TV well. Everybody knows everybody. <laughs> I was trying to think. So for me, um, I think 9-11 would probably be the closest to what we are dealing with now. So talk about what it's like for you guys behind the scenes. Um, how are the TV stations now? Are, are you able to even go into the newsroom or in the studio? Um, I know that you are still reporting. So how does that work? Sure. You can't like mic up someone and interview them, but you need to get those sound bites for stories. And, you know, a great question, indeed. What, how, is, how have journalists been impacted sort of covering the story to bring it to everybody, right? Because uh, perhaps, yes, not like healthcare workers, essential, but yes, communication and getting the word out is essential. So uh, a lot of newsrooms around the country, if not most, uh, whether it's print or television, and I can talk about the ones that I am familiar with here in the Southeast, are making most reporters work from home, so working out of our home using Zoom, Zoom technology and interviewing online or FaceTime or Skype or whatever digital tools that we can use to record and then downloading those files and then editing from our laptops at home. Even a lot of producers are producing rundowns from their home. Rundowns are sort of like line by line items, of course, trying you know, but for, for your viewers, how they stack the show. So the story one, story two, working from their home. A lot of anchors even, I mean, we saw Chris Cuomo, Brooke Baldwin, CNN anchors, 
who unfortunately tested positive, they're working from their home. I know one of the anchors in Augusta, uh, Mary Morrison, they've set up a, a, a device that so she can anchor from her house. I mean, it's unbelievable. I would have never thought reporters and journalists and anchors can broadcast from their homes, but we have to, we have to do social distancing. There are some spaces in newsrooms where they've sort of kept people together. If, you know, for some people do have to be inside, of course, like the directors, the people hitting the control room buttons. So there are, there, there is a skeletal crew. For the most part, newsrooms are completely redoing all this. Reporters using their phones to go live, using those iPhone live kits. And it's insane. Even mic, micing, we have these long little kind of like rods that you use, or you use handheld mics and you Lysol wipe it. But for the most part, I've been using Zoom technology. And unless there's a governor's press conference, and even then they sort of have these like black little tapes they put down and we're supposed to be scattered and you know they, they do it in bigger spaces. I see a lot more of the reporters wearing masks. So yeah, there, there's there's a lot of precaution, a lot of things happening. I did read one thing which I think is important to share. Masks are important, but gloves are not. Ditch the gloves. Uh, we spoke to an expert from Emory and a few folks and they said, the reason is there's a cross-contamination of gloves, right? You wear gloves, you touch the trolley or you touch something, you touch your phone, touch your purse, touch your wallet, you're spreading whatever is already on there to that. So, and this is the respiratory illness. That's why they're saying masks important, whatever mask, anything. I use, you know, when you go on the planes, they give you those eye masks, that's what I use. <laughs> hey, it works, it covers the mouth and nose, right? Anything that works, use a t-shirt with rubber bands. If you don't have one, make one. Um, or put your t-shirt up like that. Just something so you're not, especially if you go to the grocery store, if you go to places where you can't socially distance, those are options. So. Going back to your original question, yeah, news I think have completely changed. And if there's any lessons learned, I think we're going to be seeing a lot more efficiency or doing things a different way now post COVID nineteen, because we didn't know about. We I definitely knew about Zoom, but not to the point of using it to record interviews. Or you know, I mean, we do press conferences on on you know, Emory does one. They have one you know every few days, and there's all these reporters that are on. We use the chat to ask our press questions, and the expert is there just like how me and you are talking, and it's. It's unbelievable. It's it's changed sort of that the, the perception of how to do interviews because the quality is clear. It's good, good. You know, you're not going to get your cutaway shots, or you know, you're seeing people walk away or all that. But at the end of the day, in a time like this, what do people want? They want information. They want to know about testing and numbers and cases and what's happening to their community. And the big question, the million dollar question that we want to know is, when are things going to go back to normal, if ever? But there's got to be that date, the the the, the, the reopening date. So. So you've been covering, um, yeah. you've been there. Um, I've seen you at just about, you know, all the governor's um, press conferences and stuff. So I know that he has been getting a lot of support, but also some criticism for how, um, you know, some people would say that he was a little delayed on calling the um, shelter in place and then with the beaches and everything. So sure. you're there. Um, what do you, what are you hearing and what do you make of that? So, Again, going back to when all of this started, March 2nd was the first press conference when it came to covering coronavirus for the first few cases that were reported. I think it's been less than two weeks, not last Wednesday, but the Wednesday before, uh, April the 1st, I, I believe it was actually April the 1st, April Fool's, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm gonna double check that to be a good journalist and double check and not give you the wrong information. Yes, April 1st was when we had a press conference and a couple of the press conferences were, they were streaming them online. They were doing WebEx and other other ways to, to, to get the information out. Uh, April the 1st, 11 days ago, we had we had a press conference outside. That's when, and the governor talked about implementing a statewide shelter like almost 45 minutes into the conference. So, by, you know, when, when he didn't say the first few sentences, the first things that he, he was talking about, we were like, okay, we're not gonna have a statewide shelter. So we, I asked him, you know, and, and I, I always try to be nice about it, but still we have a job to do. And our job is report the information, ask the questions people at home are wondering, hold the powerful accountable. And my question was, at that point, there were about 150, 159 deaths. And I said, you know, it's great you're doing the statewide shelter. People are relieved and hopefully going to follow it. Should this have been done sooner? What do you want to tell those people that didn't, you know, that lost loved ones the, 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 during those four weeks that we didn't have anything? You know, and, and, and what the governor did say, and, you know, I think it's also easy for us to point blame or point fingers. We have to ask the question. And the governor, I, I, I do understand, got... A lot of slack on it on social media. I think Sanjay Gupta and Anderson Cooper, there was a lot of you know back and forth. Like, how do the governor not know? The CDC is in Atlanta. And they were reacting to a question that he said. He basically said, I didn't know that people who were asymptomatic could spread the disease. And a lot of people did know that. 
perhaps he was going through different models or there was new information given to him. There's a, a million different things that happened behind the scenes that we, of course, are not privy to know, but that's what he said and that's the word value that we take for. So a lot of journalists and reporters were like, well, if you didn't know that is negligent, and if you were sort of, if that was your reason, it didn't seem like a strong enough reason, right? So, you know, yeah, we asked we asked him that question. I've asked him questions about race relations and the president has constantly called it the Chinese virus. We've, we've heard people on social media say a lot of Asian Americans, people like me and you, luckily I have not, hopefully you haven't either, but are, are being targeted and asked, why did you bring the virus here? And questions like that, and that needs to stop. And that comes from top down. The way your, your leaders, deal with the, with the situation and and communicate is so important. The governor luckily did not say anything like that, which is very nice. And I, I, I gave him a shout out. Thank you for not saying that. But the president did call it this. What do you want to tell the Georgians? About 4% of Georgia's population is Asian American. And I know, you know, um, Buford Highway, a lot of Asian restaurants, those places that we're seeing people not go there because like, oh, I don't want to get coronavirus. And I always ask this trend. I think it's important to, to talk about it. When Italy had all those cases, when Spain had all those cases, did you stop eating tapas or Mexican or you know Italian food? You know, did you stop going to Olive Garden? Why pick one? I'm glad people were not like that. But don't distinguish or discriminate one ethnicity because of one I think it's so important to be empowered and educated and learn. And a lot of that does come from our leadership. But in this time of misinformation and fake news, as people call it, fake news is the thing that you see people texting and spreading and things on social media. You do have to rely on your credible news organizations, whichever news outlet you believe in, right? But your your, your newspapers, your the CDC, New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, MSNBC, or Fox News, whoever you choose, but those are the credible news organizations, not some random Joe Schmo that tweeted something or texted you something saying, oh, I heard from so-and-so, from so-and-so, they're shutting the country down. Right. So we're you- making stuff up. That's not news. Right. And and I, I agree. And wait, so with that said, where do we... Are you, do they think we're doing a good job here in Georgia? Are we flattening the curve? Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? At least for Georgia, there's any consolation prize. In this, Georgia apparently is doing well. We had a call on Friday with uh, Dr. Carlos Del Rio. He is a professor at Emory. Uh, he's been on a lot of the, 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 the national news networks. He said that they're not as inundated and at capacity as they thought, which means the, that Georgians are staying home, social distancing and flattening that curve. And to explain what that means for a lot of people who don't understand, there are models, COVID Act Now, COVID19.org, a lot of different you know, scientists and professors and those in the field of medicine and doctors coming together and predicting these models based on input rates. At a certain point, right, at, at your local hospital, it, it, just say for argument's sake, they can take 500 people or 500 patients. Once you start getting 600, 700, that is when they've already reached capacity and that's called the point of no return. Luckily though, in Georgia, they're saying we're not seeing cases like New York, or Italy or France, because we are staying home and flattening that curve. We're, we're not gonna get those peaks. But again, he said it was too early to say that's like the stock market. You can't say, oh, things are amazing. They're definitely going the right direction, which is a good thing. But until we can really fully open up the country, we'll need more testing and be able to do this. Because think about it, for people like, people who have kids or people like us who are out and about interviewing folks and in, in that public setting, you really want to go out and put yourself out there not knowing if someone else is still carrying the virus, carrying COVID-19. And right. there's talked about a second or third wave, perhaps when it gets warmer again. So, uh, you know, when it's cooler again, not warmer. So in the summer month, maybe it goes down, but then it makes a reappearance again in the fall. We don't know. It's still so early to tell, but I think that's that's why there's a race for that vaccine. And Emory, I believe uh, the FDA recently approved a clinical vaccine trial. Um, it's an oral drug that Emory researchers are working on. So that's going to take a while. Are we prepared? We weren't, clearly. But now I think it's that we better do this quickly and fast because now lies are at stake. So. Yeah. And, you know, earlier this week, I talked with uh, uh, John Paul Kroom, who is the president of Wellstar North Fulton Hospital. And he said that they would be prepared for makeshift hospitals, you know, if they needed to, like in New York City. So that's good. I think that everyone is thinking ahead and planning. Right. Being prepared. Well, it's not breaking news. I just came in about an hour ago. The Georgia governor's office said they're putting 200 makeshift beds at the Georgia World Congress Center, making it a hospital, just like in New York where they're doing the Javits Center. So the governor's office, and I will applaud them for this, right? they are definitely looking at other options, other buildings, other places where they can reopen and add beds and add pods. There's also a couple of quarantine sites. You know, for example, if a flight attendant or someone who doesn't live in Georgia was flying through or flying in and sick, where are they supposed to quarantine? You can't put them in hotels. 
you can't really put them anywhere. So they have a couple of, there's Monroe County in Forsyth near Bacon, and there's one halfway in Rutledge between Augusta and Atlanta um, at um, one, of the, one of the national parks there. They've, they've put these trailers. So I think the state leaders are doing their part and we are doing our part asking questions. But to give a definite date, I think I would say at least summer, at least Memorial Day, because the statewide shelter could still extend, but I think it'll be sort of a new normal and a slow, gradual opening of things. So I don't think it's going to be like all at once and the whole country will reopen. New York no, I, will take I, time, definitely, because they have what? New York has more cases than any country in the world, obviously minus the U.S. I mean, that's in, in, insanity to think about that. They've well, already gone through 9-11 and now this. Can we talk about the peak, um, the pandemic peak? I know that originally I thought I saw a date of April the 23rd and now yeah. I'm seeing it's moving up to April 20th. Is that what? 20th, it? that is correct. Well, I think the, the the models change so often and they look at a lot of these cases. They look at hospital beds, patients coming in. 23rd was the date, but uh, when I spoke to the professor at Emory, Dr. Carlos Del Rio, he said that it's sort of like the statistical analysis, plus or minus two days here and there. So we're about a week away from that from that peak. So we're still not in the clear, and we may never really be in the clear because you never know. For example, this Friday, this past Friday in Augusta, uh, one of the newsrooms that I work for, uh, WJBF, and they said that there were more than, I think, 67 or 70 cases in one nursing home. One. Right. Think about that. One nursing home had 70 cases nearly, and then we don't know how bad those cases are. These are obviously folks who are older, perhaps who already have underlying conditions, and hopefully there are no deaths. But again, it's so early to tell. So when we speak to the state health department, they always say that nursing homes, long-term care facilities are most at risk. A lot of the deaths, unfortunately, are in places like that where there are close proximity of people who are older or sicker who have conditions. And unfortunately, you can't go visit them now. But again, I think uh, there, there's a lot more stricter measures in place. The, the National Guard is being deployed to help their checking employees uh, fever and temperature before every shift. They're getting rid of group activities. There, there, there is a process in place. But again, like anything, nothing is going to happen overnight. It right. takes time. But at least in Georgia, the peak, uh, they believe some states will peak sooner. They're saying some hot spots are Houston, Chicago, I believe, Detroit, Washington, D.C. Luckily, Atlanta is not one of them. Okay. But we don't know if that is going to change. But April 23rd was the original peak date. It sort of moved up. And we may not even get to those peaks. That was the predicted model. But if you look at a couple of different models, they're talking about multiple ways. Maybe it goes down now, but then if there's a, 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 a huge case at a, a church service, for example, Easter, right? This is exactly why they say online. Um, yes, it's not ideal, but it's yeah. it's much safer than, than going there, risking yourself or putting other people at risk because it takes that one person to uh, to contract it. But we really all owe it to ourselves and our community and we have a chance to save the world. And the good news, I think you've seen this too, uh, and we've seen some, you know, the Himalayas for the first time, you can see how clear it is. The pollution level in some countries, like, you know, we are polluting and killing the planet. This is mother nature way of perhaps saying, no, no, it's my turn. So we do owe it to ourselves and our civilization to save it. And listen, we're all in it together as they see, keep saying, right? At this point, what does it matter if you're, if you have a car, a fancy car, a fancy house or an amazing job, it doesn't matter. We're all collectively trying to combat this global pandemic. I know it, it does put things into perspective. Um, I wanted to ask you the difference because we keep hearing all the terminology, the difference between shelter in place and then the public health state of emergency. I know that the last press conference the governor mentioned had two different dates for that. What is the difference? Great question. So basically the difference in those two terminologies, I'll start with the public health emergency. That gives the governor the authority to do certain things. So it gives the governor to do things like bring in doctors from out of state who perhaps don't have the license or nurses to practice in Georgia, but if we get to those peak or we need more doctors, it gives them the authority to bring those folks in. It gives the governor authority to deploy the National Guard to help clean facilities and de you know deliver supplies like PPE protective equipment to some of those hospitals and healthcare providers. The statewide shelter, there, there's multiple words, statewide shelter, statewide lockdown, they all essentially mean the same thing. That basically means you as an individual have to stay at home and only essential services are allowed. And those essential services are grocery store workers, some banks, hospital, healthcare workers, you know, you know, the gyms, hair salons, movies, bowling alleys, theaters, tattoo parlors, massage centers, those are not considered essential. Those places will be closed until that date. So originally it was April 13th, it was supposed to expire tomorrow, but it's now being extended till the end of the month. So about three weeks, April the 30th. That doesn't mean that 
it may not get extended again. It could get extended. Yeah. I believe in LA, they've extended to May 15. And the reason is they don't know. They kind of watch these models and numbers and see if they're ready. And we may not be ready. We may have to extend it. And honestly, even if they don't extend it, I think it's up to you and your family to make those decisions. If you are someone who's perhaps have a weaker immune system or you have some older folks living with you or, you know, you do not want to be out about. You have to make those decisions. Folks who are younger or healthier, help, help, help your folks, help your neighbors, go get groceries and buy it out for a few weeks. I, I went on Friday, toilet paper's out still, frozen vegetables still out, yeah. no Lysol. Help people out and just be smart. If you have to go to the store, go once every few weeks instead of going multiple times. But statewide shelter means you are locked down. You're not supposed to leave your house. And of course, you know, gas stations and all that are open, but really, I mean, I don't know if anyone needs more than a lot of gas if you're not going to be going out. Yeah. Same with, you know, the governor did talk about, there was a lot of uh, back and forth about the, the, the state parks and the beaches, especially in Savannah, in coastal Georgia. The governor said, well, we still want people to be able to exercise. This is not like spring break, but this is not an opportunity for you to organize a big get together. You go for a run or a walk and exercise, sure. My two cents, my opinion as an Atlanta journalist, most of you are probably not going to drive to Savannah or the beach, if you really shouldn't, or a state park. Get some walks in your neighborhood. Figure out the time that maybe it's not super busy. If you see someone, maybe, you know, wear a mask if you need to, but walk on the other side. Get your exercise. There's a lot of online streaming for, you know, workouts like jumping jacks, Orange Theory and Core Power Yoga, where I work out. They have a lot of these free videos. You have enough at your fingertips with your laptop on your phone. Put some music, do whatever you can at home, go for a run in your neighborhood. If you're near a park, do that. But yeah, there's there's more than one way to, to be locked down. It doesn't mean that you can't get out of your house, right. but collectively we're trying to do that. I mean, when I drive down to these press conferences, Tran, it's surprising to me sometimes when I still see so many cars out and about at two o'clock in the afternoon. No, there's no reason. Two o'clock, why are you driving? Unless you're a doctor, there's absolutely no reason for you to be doing that or a healthcare worker. So I think people people need to take this seriously and understand you do have to, this is not a joke. This is life or death. And you don't want to be adding to the unfortunate statistics that we already are at. I mean, we talked about that, right? Half a million cases in the U.S., almost 22,000 deaths. Yeah. That's not a small number. That's what, not to compare tragedies, but that's a lot more than 9-11. Well, I, you know, and I think we, I feel like people are taking it more seriously now. Um, I see that my friend Miriam is on here. She actually owns um, Cafe Istanbul. Um, Great place. Love that place. The one in Holcomb Bridge, right? Yeah, well, she, has, she has several locations, but I go the one on Holcomb Bridge. Right, um, me too. For the Alpharetta Suburbia guys, right? Yeah. So, you know, I think you know, her concern with many other restaurant owners is what's going to happen. Um, you know, she's still able to have delivery and pickup, but some restaurants are not. Like, is there something that's being done or being considered to help, you know, small business owners later? That's a great question about restaurants. So restaurants cannot actually be open with the statewide shelter, with the statewide lockdown. You cannot actually have dine-in service, but at least till the end of the month. But what you can do is curbside delivery or you know, get it delivered home or pick up, all of that is possible. So if you are, if you, you know, if you're living in a neighborhood or whatever, uh, there is a, a website called Nextdoor Deerfield, or we have Nextdoor Deerfield, that's where I live, but it's called Nextdoor. And I think you, you can post, look, look at the list of restaurants that do deliver or are able to pick up and help support them. Because think about those restaurants that are unable to, they have to lay off their staff or furlough their staff or shut down. But you don't have to do it every day, but you know, maybe once once or twice a week if everybody can help support, that is a great way. There is There are some small business grants that the government is working on. So okay. those are other ways for them to, to help. But of course they need your support. So when you're maybe going to that grocery run, maybe you go pick up some food, get it delivered, you can have that meal. So it's one less thing that you have to worry about making a trip. Or you know, some places like Instacart, there are some grocery things and tip those folks. A lot of us, unfortunately are not, you know, you are saving money if you think about it in one way, right? You're not spending money on gas as much or eating out as much. So help those who are helping you. So, and my, my parents, and this might be a little overboard, they are wiping down, you know, groceries or any of the bags or anything that we bring in just to be safe. You can never be too safe. If you want to do that, go for that. But in terms of um, small businesses and restaurants, you as an individual can post on Facebook or your community. There's a restaurant that I personally love. Uh, it's called Bojanic, an Indian restaurant in Lennox. They're doing takeout Thursdays or takeout, uh, like touchless takeout or something like that. And it's a great idea. You know, they have these food trucks and you just email them and they, they you just come and pick up what you need to and go. Yeah. So I think it's also for restaurants to be smart to market and let them know we are delivering, we are open and post to social media because that's where people are checking their information. And yeah. Let them know what's available because if you don't tell them, people will see your clothes. So I think it's sort of like, yeah, you got to do both ways. 
Yeah, so here in, in Roswell, we have um, our tourism uh, industry has Visit Roswell and they do a great job of putting together, I mean, almost daily flyers, a list of all the restaurants that are open, who has pickup, who has delivery, um, what dates. So it's really great. I feel like Roswell, we kind of, we've been taking care of our um, small businesses and our- That's restaurants. awesome. But that's, that's awesome. But that's that, you know, perhaps the government is going to try to help with some grants. Um, and even with that, we don't know when that's gonna be there. So it's great that the government is helping, but think about these, right? Even the stimulus check, you're not getting it right away. So it's, there is that process, it's gonna take, Time to get that and the biggest thing that people can do is help help them stay afloat for now and if you're a landlord or someone who owns space or knows someone and maybe someone's not able to pay their rent maybe help them freeze it for a while because i always say tell people think about it this way wouldn't you rather maybe forego a payment and still keep the tenant than be like oh we need a big you i get it everyone's struggling and suffering but long term right isn't it better to maybe skip a month rent but then still keep them for 11 months and you're helping them out so I think people just need to shift that perspective and think about it big picture and do what you can to help somebody else, whoever that is, right? Whether it's donation drives, ordering food in, Instacart, whatever that is, we all are able to do something. I mean, somebody reached out to me today about getting money for um, uh, masks and things like that. And I was getting ready for our interview and I actually sent it to a friend of mine who does a lot of sponsorship and donation and he chipped in. If you can help or if you're not able to right away, ask your network. We all have people that can help us post inspirational stuff like that to help somebody out. Because you believe it or not, if you don't ask, people won't know and they may not be able to help. But for the, the restaurant I mentioned, right, I said, hey, it's a little far from me. It's in Buckhead. So I'm, I'm not going to make the drive down there. But I at least wanted to post it and share it on social media so those who are perhaps nearby there or are interested can go ahead and do that. Right? Yeah. So do it's your part to help. Part. Exactly. Yeah. Do your part to help everybody else out. Well, I, I love that, you know, that you care about your community too. So let, I would like to wrap it up with what is next? Um, I know you can't predict, no one can predict what's going to sure. happen next, um, but you have been closely, you know, following uh, state officials. So what can we expect next? Great question. I think what we can expect is sort of coming together in terms of how we will handle things like this going forward and maybe changing things that we perhaps did not realize. A lot of industries, unfortunately, have been really, really hard to hit. The airline industry, the tourism industry, the hospitality industry, all of these places. So again, I always like using the word flip the switch. This could be a great time for people to travel more because airlines and you know travel packages may be offering more deals. A lot of airlines have extended um, status. Uh, you know, that's great. I think what we're gonna see though is we're gonna probably see a lot more, you know, people are not gonna run right away and try to congregate in large groups. So those type of events, maybe event organizers like concerts or huge sporting games may not be the new normal. Even I, I read something on Twitter, which I thought was interesting. People may not be willing to do high fives or even fist bumps or elbow, whatever, that, that distance between people. But a lot of these things we should be doing regardless. You should be already washing your hands. You should already probably not be double dipping. You know, things that we should probably be already doing. I think those are gonna be a lot more uh, people are going to think about that more. They may be more online learning, online meetings, online communication. We may not have that, oh, let's go have a coffee and talk about XYZ. Hey, you know what? We might be able to do it over the phone. I think those things are going to change. This is certainly going to be impacting the economy. Those perhaps looking for work, you know, I think the, the biggest unemployment in the world, the history of the U.S., uh, last was 16 million. I mean, that's a lot of people. 16 million people without a paycheck. So I think this is going to change a lot of things. And you know, the funny thing is, Tran, we're in an election year. I keep forgetting, I'm like, oh yeah, there's an election happening. Right, right. That's sort of taking the back seat. And in Georgia, they moved the date now to June 9th for the primary. So another another little plug in for those of you who care about change or want things to happen. June 9th, I believe that the, they're mailing out absentee ballot apps. You can vote from your home. Fill those out if you have certain interest or in politics or want certain things, do your research, do that. Because you know, we do have an election this year, believe it or not. I know before coronavirus with all those debates. And now it looks like it's a Joe Biden versus Donald Trump ticket. But even locally, there's racist school board and county commission and all that. So do your part, be a good citizen. And I, I, I don't know, I don't have an answer in terms of when it could be even August or things somewhat go back to normal. But I would just say we individually should figure out our, what we're going to take away from this. You know, I always tell people, we have a lot of time now in your hands. Write that book you've always wanted. Work out more. Go do those things you always wanted because you've been given the gift of time. Yeah. And you are able to use it well. If you don't, that's okay. But you do have a lot more time in your hands, so it's up to you to use it wisely. I do feel bad for seniors and those who are going to miss out proms and college. I mean, 
there's a lot of unhappiness, there's a lot of unfortunate situations, but I think if people can look at the silver lining, look at the bright side in this and take that, we can all walk away a little bit richer, a little bit more comforting to know, you know what, we survived this. We, we, we can do anything. We, we survived a, a global pandemic. This is contagion in real life, people. How yeah. crazy is that? Yeah. Well, that's, thank you for leaving us with that positive message, because you're right, because sometimes it's easy to kind of get lost in our despair and what's going on. And sometimes, you know, we do have to remember we have a privilege that we are still here and we are, you know, staying healthy. Um, thank you for putting yourself out there on the line. It's so a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for interviewing me and having me on the show and talk about this. And I think all of us can do our part, whatever little, however small, big. In fact, I got inspired to organize a clothing drive at some point. You know, when the nights get cold or chilly, a friend of mine were talking, you know what? We have a home. We have we have heater. We have a roof over our head. Unfortunately, some of these people don't. Yep. Let's do our part, whatever that is. Whatever you can give. You can donate. You can help. You can share. You can communicate. You can offer free lessons. If you're, if you're skilled at something, you are, do it online. Teach a free dance class. Build them on a free graphic. Give a presentation. This is your chance to help the world. Because wow. money will come and money will go, but this time is so important to everybody, and we're all shining stars. We just have to let that light shine. Oh, well, thank you. You are a bright light. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks now, so much. We do have we do have that um, severe weather coming, so we'll get in lockdown and and uh, be safe tonight. Thank Charge you. Charge your phones, everybody. Charge your yeah. phones. All right. Good night. Good night. Thank you.